All right. Um, we want to make sure that we um, we know the teacher stakeholders like to be in on the CIO report. Chris does a great job of kind of communicating where we're at as a fund. So we're going to go ahead and do the um, – let me just make sure I'm – we're going to have Chris, and then a client advisory will happen right after we finish the CIO report. So those of you who want to go to client advisory, uh, we'll do the CIO report, and then you guys can head out. We'll move on the agenda. Chris. Thank you, Sharon. Um, boom. So the uh, size of the assets back at April 30 was $193 uh, billion. Uh, there, are they here? Where the heck did they go? Oh, there, okay. <laughs> Sandy's here, so we're good. Everybody's here. Um, uh, we now stand at about 191 the first uh, couple of weeks of uh, uh, April, or pardon me, May, which is historically a pretty bad month for the market. It was actually uh, kind of mild, but we did decline a little bit, and the first uh, weeks of June were, were rough. So we stand at about $191 billion now. Um, you can see that the asset growth for the year has been very low. Keep in mind that we have a negative cash flow. Um, for Nora's case, we pay out more in benefits than we get in in contributions. And so we're always swimming against the uh, current uh, of a, the attune of um, uh, almost uh, $10 billion a year of negative cash flow. So for us, if we just hold even – from where we were last June 30, we'll actually have a positive return, which seems odd to people. Um, this year, you know, we're, it, the seven and a half looks like a, a very big challenge, um, uh, but we are at least uh, positive year to date with a few months left to go, or a month left to go. Here's the asset allocation. Um, we also show it uh, both as a percentage of the assets, but then we also give you the ranges of the highs and lows relative to our asset allocation targets. Uh, the little dot is an example of where we're actually invested. Uh, as I've highlighted before, we're a bit low in private equity. That is a fa function of the fact that private equity is a four-year investment cycle, and the fact that the U.S. equity market has been so strong. Uh, we've been investing in private equity, but just not able to keep pace. Um, so you cannot buy private equity access other than the secondary market, and as we discussed earlier, that market exists, but it's not very robust. So let's look at the uh, U.S. equity market fiscal year to date. Uh, I took this picture about two weeks ago. We've been even volatile around then. Uh, but you can see that, that so far this year, you know, obviously October was uh, a difficult month, but the market is up, um, but in more of a choppy fashion. Uh, and this is a graph where I'm zooming in. So here we look at from June 30 to date, but then zoom in just since Valentine's Day. So I realize, I guess it's well over 100 degrees outside. Valentine's Day seems like a long time ago, but it really wasn't uh, in terms of trading days. Um, and what you can see is a real sawtooth pattern. Uh, there really is not much movement in this market. While we have set all-time record highs, they've been barely higher than where we were before. And I would really say the momentum is out of this market. So that low return environment, um, the bull market is still alive. But as I've said, it's very long in the tooth and very flat. So I would refer to this, you know, if you think of a marathon race, we sprint it off. This is really that pause, hopefully in the middle of this bull market where it kind of catches its breath. Uh, doesn't mean that we won't potentially have a flat time period, but I think we're just going to have a pause in the market um, as we wait for corporate earnings. So when I get, climb up the crow's nest and look out on the horizon as always, and I'll get that animation to work, um, I think the, the house views, as we say, the, the mega trends that we're watching is, are really the central bank moves, the risk of tightening here in the U.S., but also we're seeing easing in Europe and in Japan. Uh, and a little bit of tightening already out of the Bank of England. So the divergence of central bank moves. You're going to hear a lot of talk continue about when does our Federal Reserve re raise interest rates for the first time. I've made light of the fact that a quarter of a percent is not much of a move off of zero. But what I will acknowledge all the time is that 
if they raise rates, it's the first time there's been a change in direction in almost eight years. And so it's just that is a significant move. So uh, all lives are on Greece still today. Even last night, uh, there was some very tough talk about Greece. We sent everybody by email a link to Financial Times website that has a pretty nice debt calendar that they continue to update. So you can see all of the debt payments Greece has to make. Um, and what's interesting on that, if you click on IMF, there are payments they have to make to IMF and then also borrowings they get from the IMF. So the IMF wants to get repaid at the same time they're loaning them more money. Um, but it is going to be an interesting experience watching uh, certainly the rest of June as it comes to Greece. On the positive side, uh, our Federal Reserve is being patient. GDP is about 2%. And as we've tried to emphasize, corporate earnings are, are strong. We're starting to see more mix in corporate earnings. It's not just taking off to you know a, an 8% growth rate. But overall, the US economy is still in that Goldilocks. Not too bad, not too good, doing OK. And, and we're seeing a return out of certainly our long-term investments. Um, I want to emphasize for the audience, we have a lot of annual reports that are available on the .com website. To help the board with the board book, we've been trying to put more things electronic and less things in paper. Uh, we also have quarterly reports out available for the public, and we're now starting to post a, a video every quarter for the public to view. This quarter, it has to do with um, our asset allocation. It talks a little bit about our asset allocation process that we're going through right now, and also what the current asset mix is. We'll shoot a new video in July, and that'll do with our, our fiscal year in return. So every quarter, the video changes to more topical information. Um, but that way, uh, certainly for the audience in the back that writes their own newsletters, they could hyperlink to our, uh, our, our website to see those videos and get that information. So with that, I want to be quick and short questions. I'll go back to the asset allocation. You bet. Thank you. Client advisory will begin now in the room next door. So, and I'll just for the investment committee's information, uh, we uh, approached the client advisory committee uh, last month at last meeting and asked if they'd enjoy those at a glance presentations we do for you, and they said yes. So every quarter or every every meeting. We're going to have an asset class go over and go through the at a glance with the client advisory. Um, and as they're leaving, and the trick is we're going to give them a test. Because when I asked my staff if they would enjoy giving teachers a test, they thought that was pretty good. So, but we'll see how effective, we'll see how effective, oh, rats, we'll see how effective we are in teaching them. And we'll let you know whether they find it valuable or not. Right. I'm going to item five. So I'll lead up. This is your. Oops, there we go. Uh, this is your opportunity to vote uh, for your work plan objectives, as some of the other committees have done uh, this month. They will be formally adopted by the retirement board at the uh, uh, July meeting. Uh, Sharon would present those to the retirement board uh, on page INV 16. I would encourage you, we're doing it the old school way, is on paper, pull that out if you would right now. Um, this is where, pardon me? Chris. We went green before green, green was Chris. cool. <laughs> Hello. Green. We're sustainable. <laughs> That's why we printed it. We killed trees. I'm sorry, we're in the timber business. That's a good thing, yeah. We culled the forest. Is that what we should say better? Um, so here we go. Thank you for, uh, Muriel remembered ahead of me. Um, so if you put your name on there, uh, you get seven points. Uh, this is also before you vote, this is a chance for you, or you, you uh, fill out the form, that's a better way to say it. Uh, you can advocate for one of these that you think is the most valuable. Uh, we've done it this way so that you can allocate all seven points to something you care about or uh, allocate you know, one across uh, each topic. Uh, we've left a lot blank. You talked about it last month, but this is a chance to add things to that list. So are there things you want to advocate for? Anyone? Chris, I'm, is he 
ask McVarris to say? No. We're, that's why we have this piece of paper, is we're supposed okay. to vote. I know. <laughs> so just But there are some people, there are some things that if you, you know, this was your chance. I didn't say it well. This is your chance if you're a board member that feels strongly about, oh, I don't know, the education and evaluation of timber investments. You could encourage and rally your fellow board members that this is something we really need to study. So, or just what, vote. What you were just asking, Chris, I just want to make sure. So, so board members can vote on this ballot, but if yep. you want to advocate or add something new. So, yep. Tom, was that what you were going to do, or which you could do now while your feather board members are considering it? It's only half. Is it is it half a joke and half serious? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so right. I'm serious. Sorry, I'm I am serious about that. I just I know it's been a long day and. Uh, private but this, equity portfolio. You had a very healthy counts. discussion. Um, sorry, private, Tom. Okay. You had a very healthy discussion at the April meeting about some of these, and uh, this would be a good time to do that unless you already know what you want. So, Tom, were you saying private equity? Uh, portfolio back? allocation by sub asset class and, uh, and, and, and a look at the pipeline by sub asset class. Okay. So what I'd say, Tom, is if, if that's your suggestion, you can write it in on that yeah, no, other. Yeah. Okay, Irena. Well, I, I was just going to make clear that the, the way this is this works is that you add it up, and whatever gets the most points gets the attention, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if Tom is the only person who writes that in, and yeah. everybody else puts their seven points right. somewhere else, it's not going to be part of the plan. Right. So right. we we need to, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure that everyone's writing it, you know. So if we think it's an important thing. We should probably. So what are we going to call it? Tom? So, so Arena is suggesting to be <laughs> equitable in terms of the voting process is that if somebody makes a suggestion to add into the other column, that we should all write it in, right? Correct. So that so it's it's to look at sub -ass, it's to look at. I, I would suggest Tom that it be a, a uh, review and evaluation of private equity, knowing that includes the sub asset classes. Private equity review. Yeah. Okay. Much sure. So write in private equity review under other. When you're done, just go ahead and put your ballot. You can put a face up or face down. Get seven points. Somebody will come by. So, yeah, Muriel will come by and pick them up. I'll have uh, Michelle and Deborah. We'll at least give you, a, a, our goal was to give you a preliminary idea today. The official results will be in the July agenda, which is due today. So. Well, that's all right. It's all good. No worries. So, Chris, are we good to go? I mean, are you going to report back in a little bit, or? Yes, I'm sorry. They're going to add those up real quick, okay. and, and so, hopefully before we go to closed session, I'll have the results to at least preliminary tell you roughly where we are. So let's go ahead and move on to item six, which is approval of our minutes from the April 3rd. So moved. Yeah. That's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Extensions? Oh, um, oh, so got that, Joe? Thank you. All right, item seven. We got here. Time to spare. <laughs> so, um, asset allocation study part three. Got Terry, got our superstar. Josh, you're always going to be a superstar in my in my eyes. Great. So just as a reminder, we're on item seven, and this is the third. This is kind of part three of our. I believe it's we're looking at seven parts. Who who knows? But that's the goal, right? Seven parts um, of our asset allocation study. We're looking at adopting the capital market assumptions, um, and this is an action item. 
Thank you. And so uh, what we were going to do is um, Carrie and I would talk, we thought, just for a few minutes and hit on just some of the high points on, of our memo. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about the assumptions and just what, what we have in there. And then Carrie could talk for a couple minutes about risk mitigating strategies uh, as it's a new class. And then uh, we'd have, you'd hear from uh, PCA and then, uh, and then Makita. So um, I guess to step back a little bit, it's, sometimes it's easy uh, for us to sort of, we take it for granted because we live this stuff every day, exactly what these are and, and what we're doing with these. And so um, what we're really asking for, for you to do is to adopt a set of capital market assumptions and its expected returns, volatility, and correlation. And so when you actually look at the numbers in there, uh, this is one of the things that we take for granted. You know, we have arithmetic returns in there. All that really is is just the average return you expect to earn year to year, and that's really all it is. And I think you've heard Chris talk about, you know, we live life year to year in linear time, and that's really what you expect to earn year to year. And then the geometric return is just that compound annual return that you would expect over the long term, where you could think of it as the, the growth of a dollar. Um, and then the volatility assumptions, just a measure that we use, um, an imperfect one, but the measure we use for risk, and it gives you an idea of the dispersion uh, in, in those year-to-year -year returns. Um, and then the, the last thing that we ask you to, to adopt, and it's uh, probably the, the least intuitive of the assumptions, it's the, the correlation assumptions. And so actually if you look, uh, if you turn to INV30, uh, that, that table, there are 105 unique numbers on that table. And so looking at it by, at, at just the individual numbers doesn't really tell you much. Uh, but, but there's a pretty, I think, simple, intuitive story here in the table. If you look sort of that left third to half of the table, there are a lot of positive numbers, shaded green. All that really means is those, those are asset classes that tend to move together. So when one's, if they're positively correlated, when one asset is moving up, the others tend to move up with them. And when they tend to move, when one moves down, the rest tend to move down with them. So, uh, all, a lot of those numbers are positive, and I think the, you hear us talk a lot about the growth risk in the portfolio. That's really where that's coming from, is, is that, positive, that positive correlation is coming from, when we talk about growth risk, they tend to move together, and, and it kind of makes sense when you look at what's in there. It's equity, public equity, private equity, real estate, those sorts of things that you tend to think of as being tied to the business cycle. And then to the right-hand side, as you move off to the right, it's really where we uh, expect to see diversification. And we talk a lot about that, and, and this is really just kind of, it gives you a simple, if you look at just the structure of that, and that, that simple summary of where diversification is gonna come from, and these, this is what we're assuming uh, will be our diversifying assets. So just to kind of give you the, the lay of the land of what these assumptions actually are. And then I think just a couple of the big themes that we hit on in the memo, uh, probably the, one of the most important ones, to my mind, is uh, coming at these with a pretty heavy dose of humility about the accuracy of these. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, we, we know that these are likely to be wrong. Um, and, and so I think there's a simple kind of picture that, that sort of shows a little bit about, you know, how you just sort of how you can be wrong. If you look at INV 26, uh, the chart on that page, figure one, is just the rolling 20-year history of equity returns, and and that's a those are those are 20-year intervals. So even on a 20-year cycle, you see you know extended periods of time uh, where returns could be anywhere between five and seven percent, and periods where they're as high as 15 percent. And that's really um, I think the the one of the messages that we want to get across is that even when you look out, even if you had we were even if we were right about our assumptions. We were right that it's, you know, public equity is, a, we're assuming a 9% return. There's a lot of volatility around those numbers. And, and so we want to really have a, a high degree of humility about how accurate we really think these numbers are. Uh, and then the other point is really about why uh, we have these assumptions and then why common assumptions. So the reason we form these is this is really the foundational material for <laughs> All of the portfolio modeling and optimizations that you'll see from the from the consultants, these are the key inputs that go into that. So they're they're really important when you look at risk return metrics in September and November. They're going to be based off of these assumptions. And so 
the reason we adopted a common set of assumptions was that we really wanted to have, if there was any debate about the assumptions for a particular asset class, we want to have that now so that when you're discussing portfolios in September and November, that, that the discussion is about you know, a particular portfolio rather than the assumptions. If you see a different risk return, it should be because the portfolio is different, not because there's just a different input being used into the, to, the, to that portfolio. So um, I think that pretty much uh, kind of sums up what I think are the, what we think are the key points of the memo. The last thing I would say is, you know, you'll see 15 classes that we're asking you to adopt assumptions for. Those are really the assumptions that we, the, the asset classes that are common to both consultants. You won't necessarily see this level of detail from both of them. They'll be aggregating their portfolios up, using these as the ingredients basically for their different asset classes. So these will aggregate up in different ways, um, but, but they'll be working off of basically the same, the same menu. So um, with that, if, I, if you have any questions, otherwise Carrie could speak to the. Jeff, let me just grab um, Terry. Uh -huh. oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, are we, how or will we be using either the geometric or arithmetic returns? Will, or are we going to come up with our own separately or what? So the, the, air, the way we, we use them and the consultants both have slightly different approaches, but basically you know, when, when we talk about doing uh, Monte Carlo simulations of the portfolio, those are the ingredients into that. So a simple way of using those would be, you know, we want to look at a future 20-year path for the, the returns of the portfolio. And, and those will be the, the source for those returns. So on average, when you do all those simulations, you know, just focusing on, say, the equity assumption, after you do all those simulations, the average annual return that you would see will be 9%. And that'll, that's consistent across all of those, those asset classes. And that's sort of the, the way we use them. I didn't really see an explanation on how you came out with the geometric. So the, the geometric return is really, it's just a product of whatever the arithmetic return is that you're using and then the volatility. And so um, if you have so a particular- So you have the volatility factor Correct. Into it also. Yeah, so for a given level of return, if you have a higher volatility, you'll have a lower geometric return. Thank you. Just particularly for the newer members, by definition, a geometric return is always less than an arithmetic return because the geometric, geometric return adjusts for risk, and risk reduces over time the end value, so the geometric return is always lower than the arithmetic. That's the point I wanted to get to. I mean, it wasn't made clear in there. Chris, did you so have just, uh, I guess, a teaching moment, particularly for the new board members, uh, the last two asset allocation studies, we haven't gone as much through this in-depth stage. We've jumped straight to the key decision factors. So what you're getting to see is the nuts and bolts of the machine. I really need to emphasize, you know, any, any software is a matter of the, of the inputs you put into it. These are the key inputs. So while we're not here to debate and ask you to decide, ooh, should it be 0.3 or 0.4, um, we, we, I want you to at least understand these and please ask us questions when things aren't clear. We realize this is a lot of math and, and individual calculations, but it's, any question is fair game because these will be the key inputs that drive the efficient frontier in the model. A couple things I wanna highlight um, the graph Josh highlighted on INV26, if you put that in a bell curve, you know, we all think of a normal, beautiful picture of an even distribution where the bell curve peaks at some median number and then has small flat tails. The bell curve for the U.S. equity market is not a beautiful bell. It's a camel with two big humps. The valley in the middle is actually where the average is. The two humps, one's at about four and a half, five percent. In other words, the equity market is either going to be about four and a half, five percent positive, or it's going to be 15 percent positive. The average is in between. And that's one of the things you have to realize. That's why it has such high volatility and, and makes it such a struggle for people to invest in the market. They just don't know where it's going to be. 
if if I draw your attention to some of the numbers we debated, and, and part of the reason PCA has one methodology, which they can elaborate on, they did in the beginning of this. Makita has a different methodology. Neither one's right or wrong. And the reason for that is because they're predicting the future. So they're all wrong. Um, last I checked, neither of them had a better crystal ball than the other, neither does staff, but, but we're going back through history. We listened to Makita's point of view, PCA's <laughs> point of view, and then what we did is look at our portfolio. So in some cases, our number is in between theirs. Some cases, our number comes in on theirs. But we felt it was important to recommend a set. Both firms agreed. We needed as staff to recommend to you a set of assumptions. They have to use the same inputs. Otherwise, we have bad information coming out on the other end in September. A couple of the ones I want to highlight. Um, for the last, gosh, probably eight years, Alan, maybe even 12, we've assumed the same return assumption for U.S. and non-U.S. equity. This will be the first time that we're assuming different numbers. So on INV 28, we are assuming uh, U.S. equity will earn on average nine, and non-U.S. will actually earn higher. The reason for that is the non-U.S. has the emerging markets in it, and we assume emerging markets will grow faster than the U.S., which means when we run this, it's going to have a bias to put more money in the non-U.S. market than it is in the U.S. market. That's radically different than our current portfolio, where we have two-thirds of our money in the U.S. and only one-third in non-U.S. So this model is going to want to push us more towards a neutral uh, to the index or even an overweight in non-U.S., and we'd have to debate that. Um, the other number, you know, obviously private equity is the only high number. The other number is real estate. If you notice, the uh, core real estate is only about 7.7. The, and, and that is a little bit higher than what PCA Makita assumed, and that's because we looked at the fact that we already have a $23 billion real estate portfolio. We can project what we think that's going to do at least in the, in the next five years and maybe out a little bit farther in terms of our current cash flows. So that's why we picked a little bit higher number there. <coughs> that also is a number that the model will favor. Um, the correlations are another thing that we debate a lot between uh, some of the fixed income securities and what the equity market returns, because that's really what it matters. The model's always going to grab a lot of equity. So what's a real diversifier? Are bonds a diversifier or not? And those are some of the debates we had. We met with both Mike Moy and with uh, Michael and McGee and, and to review the individual private equity numbers and to review the individual real estate numbers. Townsend's here, they have a representative. Both firms, I can speak for them, both firms agreed with our final number and felt they were uh, reasonable for you guys to adopt. Um, and I guess the last point I would make is, uh, as Josh said, we talk about arithmetic returns because that's what everybody's used to, but you've all heard the statistic joke, I don't know if it's a joke, but the statistical phrase about how a, a six-foot man can drown in a river that's three feet deep on average because it's one feet, one feet, 10 feet deep, one foot, one foot, one foot. We don't live life on an average. We live life geometrically one year at a time as it progresses through. So, you know, another way to think about it, your arithmetic average, you may run a five minute mile, but if that minute that mile happens to be up a hill, you're going to run a lot slower, and the other side, you're going to be running downhill and going a lot faster. So geometric measures that and picks up that. That's why we're asking you to include that this time. It technically is a much more accurate way to measure the portfolio. It's just not intuitive, as Alan was saying, for people in the public. That's very helpful, Chris. Thank you. I've got a couple of folks in the queue. Uh, Rich. A quick question. You may have answered it. I, I noticed you have differing opinions on on the uh, rates of return and on the volatility, but not on the correlations. Are we all in agreement that the correlations are right? We saw it saying kumbaya. You did. You all got together and said, we're, we're okay with this set of correlations. Yeah, we, we had, so there were differing opinions <laughs> on the correlations as well. So in PCA's and Makita's written materials, I think they have what their underlying correlation assumptions were. And then uh, we went, we had discussions and, and sort of came to 
consensus that that I think they're comfortable with on the the correlation assumptions. But definitely started out in in, in somewhat different places. So that's one thing we're not going to have to argue about because we've all kind of. Reached. I did want to make sure that around the same campfire. Yeah, to, to, I just want to add. Wait, um, oh. Sorry, just, just responding to Rich's question relating to correlations, but also uh, expected return and expected risk assumptions. Um, both us and PCA spent um, a very large amount of time over the last two months working with Josh and staff on, on all of these assumptions. So um, not speaking for, for Alan, but I believe we're both here in concurrence with the returns, the risk, and the correlations that staff is presenting is, you. Is recommending. Um, we're, we're equally confident that they are as wrong as the ones that we could come up with for you. Um, I, just, so, I, just, I just noticed that it was different. Than, which of these is not like the other? <laughs> okay. uh, Frank. Uh, Josh, can you, can you describe the CTA asset class, what that is exactly, and why your estimates are slightly different than the two consultants on that asset class? Oh, wait. Carrie can speak to that. Chief. Yes, the Commodity Trading Advisors, it, it stands uh, uh, abbreviated as CTA. It's a, just an old name from the 70s when these uh, futures trading companies first emerged. So it, it doesn't quite describe exactly what they do now, but they're also called managed futures or trend followers. And basically, they're systematic strategies, computer models. I look at price and volume data primarily to identify trends in the market, either going up or down. So they can make money primarily in those tail situations uh, across asset classes, across geographies. And um, our, our assumptions are, are based on looking at primarily historical data and the managers that we've identified to invest in currently, which are AQR and Graham Capital. Uh, and we also assumed a slightly lower uh, volatility um, because of the diversification that these managers bring. And, um, and based on an estimated sharp ratio, so that volatility kind of backed into our expected return for that class. So the use of that asset class would be to protect you on the downside? Okay. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, sure. Well, I'm going to th <laughs> thanks, Steve. But if you take a look at our slides, we have two slides, which won't take long to go through. Um, Steve said it. We had an enormous amount of dialogue between each other and a really healthy debate. We completely concur with the staff's recommendations and would urge you to look at those as being well thought out and very good for the purposes to which they'll be used. What's important to keep in mind is these assumptions will go into a model. And that model will do two things, three things, really. It will look at the future in the investment sense. Then that will be integrated with looking at the liabilities in the future. And out of that, you will see results, a broad array of results, both good and bad, how these different combinations of assets impact the future financial condition of the plan. That includes everything from funded status to benefit payments at both ends of the distribution. And I think for that, getting these right to the second, one, second decimal point doesn't really change the impact it will have at the macro level in terms of its impact on the financial condition of the plan, costs, or risk. I don't see any questions from board members. So we can, oh, okay, hang on. Now I do. Paul. Oh. So the, 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 the qu one question I had was about the, um, uh, the time frame for the for the capital market assumptions? I don't know if you're going to get to that or if that's. We, we collectively use 20 years. And, and that's that. different than we've done in the past, is that in, right? In the past, PCA, which was the only group who did it previously, has always used 10-year numbers. But the difference between 10 and 20 years, uh, really the biggest impact 
was on fixed income just because you have long duration, so I have a higher expected rate of return. But even there, it's modest, Paul. Okay, so you're you're comfortable moving from the we, 10 to the 20. I mean, it really right was there. a really cooperative, okay, interactive process, good. and we have no issues with the assumptions. Great, good, thank you. Great. Is there anything else you need to present, or? No, I think maybe we just want to pull up Makita's slides then. Okay. Hang on a second. Let's go to Tom and then yeah, Stephen. I had a question on on your second slide. You didn't flip up to it, but it was. But it is in our material. Huh? Constraints. Huh? Uh, we got to get constraints. Can you bring up? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The different. The main in, in main difference uh, between the two of you is in the number of asset classes you would ask us to consider. And what I wanted to follow up with uh, in your last presentation. Uh, you presented four, a definition of four different asset classes, that was the, and they were very broadly defined, and it was sort of a change in definition from uh, past presentations. So it wasn't just, equities wasn't just strictly global equities as traded on the, on the exchange. And so my question that's been lingering with me is how, when you take that, those four very broad conceptual classes, how do you map that to our portfolio? Uh, and what does it mean in terms of a uh, U.S. equity, global uh, European equity, emerging equity uh, allocation? Uh, does it bleed into private equity, et cetera? Where, where we would come out on that is that the discussion, let's say dollar, non-dollar emerging market, uh, that dis that really requires a discussion unto itself, which really needs a lot more time just on that issue on how to weight it. We believe in aggregate, you're going to get that return and risk out of that group of assets. That weighting changes will only impact it at the margin. But the key is getting the direction right. And using an optimizer, we believe, to make the distinction between, for example, emerging markets and developed markets, uh, that requires a level of precision that we don't believe exists. It just, you come up with, it'll give you a, it'll give you a solution, but relying heavily on that solution, in our opinion, is inappropriate. Yeah, no, I just couldn't quite map to what our assets were. I mean, that's helpful. And, uh, and, and we will, in fact, in? use your existing assets and the way you're currently designed as we look at those groups on how we weight them. So that'll be part of the process. Okay. 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 Stephen? Um, so <coughs> as, as I mentioned before and as Alan mentioned, we concur with, um, with staff on their recommendations. Uh, we put together a, a presentation and a memorandum that provides a lot of detail on uh, the process Makita Investment Group uses to um, come up with our uh, assumptions. Um, I want to um, uh, highlight that uh, uh, Josh did a um, spectacular job of digging into our models to understand um, how we think about things. Um, and so I uh, just wanted to provide some accolades to him. Uh, publicly for the amount of effort that he put in, because a lot of what we do gets pretty sophisticated and complex and um, uh, uh, difficult to understand. So we're, we're happy to go through um, kind of our, our processes and our returns, risks, and correlations to asset classes. You're not being asked to adopt those today. You're being asked to adopt um, what staff's recommendation is, which we concur with. Um, so, so uh, I, I don't think it's necessary to go through our presentation unless the board has an interest in hearing in more detail um, Makita Investment Group's processes. Yeah, one second. Irina? You know, I don't, I, for me, I don't think we need to go through all of the detail that's in the memo, but what might be interesting is just to hear a little bit about the ish, a couple of issues that were kind of the really heavily discussed, mm -hmm. just to get us a, a sense of kind of what were the major differences or, or the things that needed to be most heavily worked out. Heavily discussed and debated, right? Yeah. <laughs> And and I think Josh is really the best person because he was in the middle. Uh, so, <laughs> Literally. Uh, he, he, can, he can be the most balanced. Yeah. 
Yeah, let's see. Well, so Chris really touched on um, the, the really big ones, which were the non-US equity assumptions uh, and real estate. Uh, we also, um, I would say, it was sort of different with depending on, on the consultant. So we had a lot of back and forth uh, with Makita about assumptions. Um, believe it or not, for some of the, the way we modeled fixed income, um, just in some of the getting really down into the nitty gritty of how you assume you, you construct that class and implement the strategies um, and, and then uh, some of the correlation assumptions. Um, I think what ultimately how we came to, to consensus, you know, the numbers weren't so far off that you would have a, a different interpretation of the role of a class <coughs> or something like that. Uh, there's just a lot of variance, even in something like a correlation assumption, um, depending on the time period that you look at. And that was really how we resolved those. Um, and I think it was it was similar uh, with PCA. I think probably the, the biggest uh, discussions we had were around some of the assumptions for the risk mitigating classes and, and sort of how we thought about, particularly the volatility on a couple of those. Um, and, and Carrie touched on it a little bit with trend following. You know, basically, you know, the, the difference really boils down to the, the actual implementation we think we'll have and how much uh, volatility you can get out of a, an aggregated strategy. And that, those were kind of probably the biggest ones. I don't know if you guys remember any others that we... Yeah, I, I, I would just say of all of them, the, the risk mitigating asset class is uh, the one that is uh, subject, you know, both for the purposes of uh, this meeting in uh, recommending and approving assumptions, but also as we go through <laughs> the modeling process, uh, is subject to a lot of uh, differences of opinion on uh, how risk mitigation strategies are are implemented. And so um, we certainly had a lot of discussion with a staff on that related to the types of strategies that you'd want to put into a risk mitigation allocation. Uh, and I suspect that that will be a very, um, despite the fact that the, the constraints will likely um, require a, a very low allocation to the asset class if you approve one, um, that may take up a disproportionate amount of our time going forward because of the complexity involved in implementing those types of strategies. What's important from our perspective is just the fact that you consider a risk, mitigate, risk mitigation strategy. That wasn't on the table before. And these assumptions, having done this for 30 years, the key is the relationship of the numbers. And as long as the relationship of the numbers is appropriate, you'll get a very similar result, even from very different numbers. And that was that chart that Josh showed where you had the assets were highly correlated. Well, the fact that they're highly correlated, you're going to end up with a result where they're going to look very similar over time. And the differences, in fact, will smooth out over time. And so at the end of the day, I think the differences were really very minor and subtle. And there were no really strong disagreements. And on a risk mitigation class, that had more to do to approach, I think, than, than statistics. I'll jump into one that, um, at least at the staff level, resulted in you know, just short of a knife fight. Um, that's a joke. Uh, if you look at the second, so INV 28, um, second line, uh, non-US equity. Uh, we're recommending 9.6, but look at PCA and Makita. Uh, that's the biggest divergence between the two of them. PCA is at 9.8, uh, and Makita, uh, I don't know, being down there near Mexico, believes in, in emerging markets, they're at 11.3. Um, so we debated, you know, just do we really believe there's that much growth? And a lot of that has to do with how much of your non-US do you put toward emerging market versus Europe and Japan? And, and at the staff level, we had a very active debate about what we call developed markets versus emerging markets and, and Japan's turnaround and Europe's potential and, and demography with the aging of many of those countries. And then whether the emerging markets are the panacea they have always been made out to be, or are they just exactly that emerging markets? So do you guys want to defend your crazy 11 and percent? Not that I'm <laughs> passing judgment on that. No hyperbole <laughs> happening in this world. Well, with that introduction, um, yeah, uh, so our, our non-U.S. equity uh, return assumption is quite a bit higher than the U.S. It's, it's driven by two factors. One, is, as Chris alluded to, we do have a higher uh, return expectation for emerging market um, uh, stocks. 
Uh, it's driven by uh, several factors, um, including uh, GDP, expected GDP growth rates in the emerging world, uh, and um, also the current valuations of emerging stock markets, which uh, appear to us to be somewhat more fairly valued than the U.S. market. Um, we, we also instantly have a much, much higher risk assumption for emerging market stocks. So um, we, we don't think the return is available without the uh, accepting the volatility associated with that. Uh, but we do also have a higher uh, return expectation for developed markets outside the U.S., um, slightly higher than the U.S., and that's generally valuation-driven. So um, our statistics that uh, show that the U.S. market is um, pretty richly valued right now does filter through um, to reduce the U.S. equity return assumption uh, relative to non-U.S. equities. Even though it's a 20-year number. Yes, even though it's a, the, the effect gets diluted, but it still has an impact. So, Chris, today the action item is 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 to we can we don't have to, but we can approve the capital market assumptions. Correct. Um, we on the table would ask us? you to approve them. They go into your investment policy. They're out there public, so that people understand how we built up our asset allocation. Okay. Um, so, we would ask for a motion so we can begin building the model. The next step in this is, the, as PCA pointed out, in July we will talk to you about the constraints to the asset classes, which is also a very critical input to the model. Tom? Yeah. Um, I, I, I understand the work, and it's good work, and I appreciate the fact that it was done on a, a collaborative basis on the part of staff and the two advisors. Um, as I'm looking at the expected returns, and they are what they are, it strikes me that uh, the result of the asset allocation study, if we assume that the right answer is something that totals 7.5% or more, is that we'll find uh, quite a bit of pressure to move towards a slightly more risky portfolio than we have, uh, risk-oriented portfolio than we have now. Is that your consensus and correct? That's accurate. And we believe that the markets are pretty rich across the board. Interest rates are very low. Expected return for all the class heads are slightly below historical averages. And the result is going to be a portfolio that, to get 7.5%, will have to be aggressive. Or an enormous amount of alpha. And you have a question if you believe there's lots of alpha out there. You could have that. That's a separate debate. Alpha being where our manager outperforms and then, yeah, sorry. Okay. Alpha is uh, the term we use when a manager outperforms an index. So an equity manager is going to beat the S&P 500 consistently by some spread. I, I guess for, for the uh, uh, annoyance of, of balance, um, you know, that, that absolutely will be the, the pressure, but it, it should be... Um, addressed in the context of the higher levels of volatility that you would accept for that level of return as well. And so, um, you know, it's, that's, th th this, this entire analysis is sort of two-dimensional in the sense that you're at the same time trying to develop an asset allocation that achieves uh, return objectives, um, but acknowledging, which you have to, the, the risk and the uncertainty with any of the asset allocation policies you're ado adopting. burden it any further than needed. But in fact, you revisit this on a regular basis. And so the decisions you make, the capital markets would be quite different in three to five years when you redo this. In fact, sometimes events occur that require you to do it more rapidly. And you just have to recognize that this is for the interim. And I would be shocked if any result is dramatically different than your current strategy. It, should it be different? The answer is unequivocally yes. But if it's dramatically different, that would be quite unusual in my career. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I guess it depends on your definition of dramatically. But, um, but yeah, it ch changes, unless there's a major structural change in the markets or other factors, um, changes should be fairly modest. Just for history, so you know, we, we adopt these every asset allocation study. I think once in our career we uh, revised them mid-cycle uh, after 08, as I recall. 
Um, so the next time you'd revisit these is four years from now, now that we're doing a four-year cycle on asset allocation yeah. studies. It used to be three and then we every, It used to be every three years. Now we're going to try and link them up with your experience with study experience. on the actuary side yeah. and go in the same cycle. Got it. I'm seeing no other questions from board members. I would entertain a motion to approve or adopt a capital market assumption. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? They are approved. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> Uh, review of information requests, Jill. We had one information request uh, for staff to provide information regarding the current structure and role of private equity consultants in relationship to our policies. Can, can we amend that and just sure. talk, of, make it broader than just private equity consultants? I mean, I think I. Because it was, I think we were also looking at kind of just consultant our real estate and private equity. Sure. So, and let me let me have Harry jump in. It looks like he has. So I actually have um, a couple, uh, two requests. Um, one, I'd like to request that uh, prior to the September board meeting, the committee receive <coughs> the total cost paid to um, the consultants to the board over the last five-year period. And secondly, um, to the by past year. five years. By year. By year. By year. By year. Yes, by so. year. And total. Each consultant or category year by year. Correct. Yes. So our, our general think, consultants and private equity. And, and, and this is based upon, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, considerable feedback from the committee. I want to uh, yeah. put a formal request in that. This isn't just coming from me. I think this was, there was consensus that we want this. Um, and then secondly, I would ask that to the extent possible, we get, um, let's say, um, five other large institutional investors, U.S. comparison to their uh, cost, to the extent that that's possible. So uh, I, I'll let staff determine which Cheers. five, three to five other funds, uh, and what uh, what they have allocated um, <coughs> in those same categories over that same time period. Anything else, Joe? Nope. Great. Um, item nine, the draft agenda for the July 2015 Investment Committee. I know there was conversations, just a reminder that I believe we have it set for Thursday, correct? Chris, uh, July 9th? Correct. The goal right now, uh, Jack's put together, is uh, retirement board in the morning and investment committee in the afternoon all in one day. And we think that's doable. That. And if I could just highlight for you on INV 100, um, item three, you can scratch. Uh, that's no longer to be needed. Um, we did neglect to add one, though. Um, right before item eight would be your investment insight speaker. Um, <coughs> we have invited um, Dr. Gene Rogers from SASB. Um, they are about to begin a program of engagement uh, of the SASB, uh, which is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, similar to GASB and FASB, what they're trying to do for sustainability. Uh, and they want to begin engagement with pension plants, and we're the first. So they get to practice on us and then go out to the public. But I think you'll enjoy that. Um, uh, the business plans we will keep very fast. Um, you can also strike, I believe it's number 12. Uh, that was a continuation from last year. We are not reviewing the benchmark again. Um, and if you want, we have the results of the uh, survey. Um, uh, drum roll, uh, number one with the most votes. Can we, 
Can we finish the July agenda? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you're so excited. You just got into I that. Know. I wanted just to, to go back to item four on the agenda for July. I think you and I had discussed yes. since um, Ann Sheehan had to um, attend uh, a wonderful college graduation of one of her children. Um, we, we were planning on having a deeper dive on corporate governance today. I think we're still going to hear about managers from one of the staff, but we're going to have Ann um, give us a little bit more of a flavor of the, bro the proxy voting season and some of the issues around corporate governance that came up, particularly in the news and where CalSTRS and CalPERS kind of came out on different ends of some of those decisions. So I've asked Ann to kind of, I feel like, you know, it would be helpful for her to give us a little bit more color commentary on that. So we're planning on that for item four in July. So that tactical investment strategy discussion. So I think, you know, we had the calendar of rotating the asset classes. I think we'll just have to kind of, you know, readjust for push the fall, right? Just push it back. So, all right. Now, Chris, get crazy. <laughs> oh, hang on a second. Tom wants to have right. a comment. Um, I don't know if this is possible without being uh, really rude on our part, but we've had an awful lot of time on sustainability at, uh, in the last meetings. And there are a lot of exciting issues about sustainability, but accounting, uh, I think, might diminish the board's interest in the topic. <laughs> and so I wondered if we could possibly postpone that. Um, particularly because it will be a jam day. I can easily work with the chair and, and Jack and see how the calendar looks, and yep. I'm sure Gene would be very accommodating to us. Sure. Yeah. Pleasure of the board. Yeah. Good. Could break her heart. Um, so I have the results from the accounting firm of uh, Cunningham yeah. and Smith, <laughs> Smith and Cunningham. Uh, number one, drum roll, uh, by far, uh, develop. Investment belief statement. So that one. Uh, number two uh, is evaluation of risk mitigation strategies. Uh, so I will sit down with the chair and vice chair, make sure, as I, as I mentioned in the memo, uh, the asset allocation is probably going to take us through November, which really just leaves us February, April, and June of next year. to, And we'll try and figure out, can we get these two done, or can we really just get one done? Um, uh, just because I'm sure you want to know of note, uh, Tom, you came in uh, review of the private equity portfolio and sub asset classes came in third, but it was a distant, distant third, definitely off the list. Um, it still pays, Chris, in horse racing. You finish third, it still gets paid. Third, you get you paid. Win, place, and show. Dana? It's right at show. Dana, I, 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 I'm getting in trouble for hanging on to that timber thing because uh, it's, it just got one point. There's you, a big you, smile under it. Wasn't no, I, not on the tally sheet. So um, Chris, you're keeping it alive, but it's like uh, you know, it, you, it has never caught attention. I, I do want to ask Chris permission, if 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 it's all right with the chair and vice chair, work with you to kind of. I, I wonder if we could just kind of ref. ref I don't know, refresh that list a little bit. Maybe Absolutely. just take a few our, things off and our we'll, we'll make sure the whole board sees it so that if there's any our intent is for can give it, it to be your list, not driven by staff. It is your list think, yeah. uh, bubbled up from what the consultants think you should be looking at. So yes, right. I very much so. Given the topic where, as you said, you're wanting to discuss many things and I think we're getting ideas of items we need to put before you, but we need to get you more information. So any opp opportunities, some statements from the public? No, from the public want to say? All right. Anything I just else, wanted Chris, to, we go into one last session? thing. The sure. investment staff was going to do a wave rich, but we lost Mike. So we're. Uh, he's there. Oh, we're he's there. The, yeah, the wave. He's we're, there. We're going to try the. Oh well. Rich said on his farewell, he wanted an audience wave. Oh, he okay. wanted the stadium. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's hard forget to get it. Anyway, <laughs> we just wanted wait, wait. to wave the goodbye board, to Rich. Terry, 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 Terry. Bye bye. Terry's just sitting there. Look at us. There you go. Look at him. Oh, wow. Terry's hey. like, I'm not doing that. Let's go. Thank you all. I've been Farewell to Rich. <laughs> We're glad this last meeting was such a thrill and you want to come back I for know, more. I know, I know, absolutely. All right, with that, we're going to go ahead and adjourn into closed session. So unless you are, you need to be a board member, a staff person, 
and we're going to adjourn into closed session. Is there anyone in the room that should not be in the room? <laughs>